What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Schmo Zone. This is episode seven. I'm Dave Schmolenson, aka the Schmo. My co host is Helen Esports. Happy uh, Stone Cold Sea Boston Day. 316. Give me a hell yeah. <laughs> hell yeah. I just need the beer cans. But um, on a serious note, uh, it's a very unfortunate time and scary times that we're in right now. Definitely some scary times right now. Unprecedented. I mean, I look at sports as an escapism. And right now, it seems like all sports now are being postponed or yes. canceled. I think the UFC now has just postponed the next three fights. That's our our world. So yeah. definitely some scary times. Yeah, the next three fights. And also, I believe the PI and the UFC offices are closed uh, through the end of the month. Definitely. Um, it's very some sad times. On our podcast today, we try to stay as optimistic as possible. We're bringing in some special guests. We're going to have Eric Nixick, head coach, Extreme Couture. Um, he's going to be coming in, joining us very, very shortly. We'll have uh, UFC fighter number 11th ranked Cody Stamen come in as well. So we'll just get their thoughts and feels from what's going on. And hey, keep everyone as informed as possible and stay optimistic. Right, Helen? Yeah, trying our best. And like you mentioned, even with Cody, um, I believe he was supposed to fight on that Columbus card. And I mean, man, this stuff, it just it makes me want to cry, you know, just thinking about it even. And I know you said try to stay optimistic, but sometimes it's hard. But, you know, at the end of the day as well, um, just try to be kind to one another. Right. Try to help each other out. And of course, thank you to all the nurses, doctors, even people working at the grocery stores right now, just trying to get everything restocked and making sure that everyone has what they need. Yeah, I can't stress that enough to not panic. Uh, you can't put a price tag on happiness and kindness, and we can all be grateful to one another. That's one thing I want to stress. And we don't over panic because the grocery stores still have supplies. There's still the internet. You can get your work home done from home. You can order grocery supplies from home. Um, just just be extra close to your loved ones. Be kind to your neighbors and uh, continue to be a good human being. Yes, but like you said, um, we do have our first special guest of the day, Eric Nixick. Uh, it's always great to you know see you, to catch up with you, whether at Extreme Couture or here now in our studio. I'm, I, you guys owe me a little bit of gas money. That, that drive over there was, <laughs> was rough. I didn't know it was that close. How, how much do we owe you? Seven uh, cents? It, not even that much. <laughs> not even that much. Right down the street. What I do you threw think? a rock here. Yeah, <laughs> I, I knew it would be pretty We're like convenient. Neighbors, yeah, yeah, it was perfect. Really appreciate you coming by. This is our Schmo Zone studio. I we love it. We revamped it a little bit. Yeah, I love it. It looks great. I appreciate that, Thanks man. For me. Matches your hat. I, I was right? just going to say hat. that. I planned that ahead. <laughs> Uh, we really appreciate you coming by. I know it's kind of some dark times. I know yeah. you've had to just close down um, Extreme Couture. Mm -hmm. You just met with Randy Couture. Yep, just H left. How did how'd that meeting go? Um, it, you know, just just as you guys would expect, and I think uh, it's the overall consensus of the, the entire world right now for that. Um, I think everybody at, at, at the jump feels like almost like why them? But then we go, well, we're all in this together, too. Everybody's going through the same thing. So in our sport, usually it's like an injury or something happens and then the fight's off or whatever it may be. But, uh, you know, this is something that, that's bigger than us. You know, so taking one day at a time and taking that within the stride, we understand that everyone's going through it. And what can we do to best um, flatten that curve, the, the, that what everybody's saying, and that's keeping everybody safe. But what about, you know, as far as I know a lot of the fighters, they were willing to still fight. And I believe even, for example, like Ashley Evan Smith for the London card, she flew out there, then unfortunately had to fly right back home. Like, what were your thoughts initially of, you know, trying to keep all those cards alive? I was on that same boat. You know, I, I worked uh, with Francis this whole camp. Yeah. We put a lot of work in with, um, you know, Cody and and it's our livelihood and this is what we do for a living. But you know, with that being said, I understand that there's a lot of service industry people. There's a lot of people that their jobs are, are closing up too. We were all willing to, to, to fight. We knew that, that that's what we signed on the dotted line to do. Um, but, you know, the powers that be said that's not going to happen. So we just have to follow suit. Yeah, we're filming this podcast today, Monday, March 16th. 
316, Stone Cold Steve Austin Day. You brought up his name, Francis Ngannou. I think up until today, he thought that there is a way that he'd still be fighting. Originally meant to be in Columbus, March 28th, moved to the PI. I know the Nevada State Athletic Commission, they had a meeting. They were suspending all activity till March 25th, and mm-hmm. then they were going to reconvene and decide that wouldn't give three days enough notice to have the fight card in Nevada. Up until today... Where did you guys think this fight would happen if you guys thought at all it would still happen? Well, obviously the apex was what we thought. And then when we caught word about the vote and they were going to wait till the 25th, um, in my mind, I thought it would be like on an Indian reservation or something like in, in Laughlin or Pahrump or something along those lines. And Dana White would find a way to get it done. Um, but then the, the, the other side of that coin is, is who are you putting at risk? What kind of liability would you have by doing so? I see both sides of that coin, you know, and, and in a way, I think myself and Francis, when we talked about it, we kind of wanted to be the light in which we all needed. I mean, we, we all loved watching the Brasilia card this past weekend. It gave us something to do, and it also kept a, a sense of normalcy in our lives. So being able to train for this next week and a half, um, having the, the idea of we're going to fight in our minds kept us busy. But, you know, again, it's it's something that's bigger than us, and we're just going to have to take it with stride. But do you know, as far as the UFC and the fighters that had those card schedules and those fights scheduled so close, will they be compensated, or do you know how any of that will work? It's a good question, and, and I just I just found out about an hour ago that those fights are going to be now off. I would hope so, and, and I, think, I think the UFC is a um, good enough company to know that, hey, man, we have to take care of these guys. You know, I, I I was depending on an eight week camp and getting paid for from Francis by putting in that work. You know, we all were. We all are going to be hit by that again. But it, you know, it, it's going to be up to the UFC. I hope they follow suit with what Bellator did and and compensating their fighters and and in doing so by compensating their fighters, it also compensates their coaching staff and trainers. I want to switch gears slightly uh, to that UFC Brazil card. I know you do a lot of work with Kevin Lee. Mm-hmm. I know he floats his camp between here in Vegas with you guys at right. Extreme Couture and works with Frost Sahabi over at TriStar. Were you supposed to come down to the Brazil fight card? Did any of this kind of get in the way of any plans? Or And I just wanted to get your thoughts and overall on his performance and everything of that nature. No, no. When um, So a lot of people, you know, the, the whole Joe Rogan and, and Kevin thing uh, was kind of a weird setup where... When, when Kevin lost to RDA in Rochester, I spent an extra day in New York with Kev. And, you know, we spent some time kind of reflecting on things. And, you know, him and I both come up under Coach Fallis. And I know what Coach Fallis expected out of me as a coach, and I know what he expected out of him as a fighter. And a lot of my relationship with Kevin was training partner, not necessarily coach and fighter. And I tried to give him the information that I felt that he needed. And sometimes I felt like in a lot of ways – I was trying to um, fulfill that role of Coach Fallis, which I, I'm not. You know, I'm not not to Kevin at least. And you know, we had a really good heart to heart in the fact of I felt that it was it was important for Kevin to find some new ideologies because sometimes he just not that he doesn't listen, but maybe there just was a disconnect there. He, we respect each other, we love each other. He's like a brother to me, but again, like. If, if, if he's not listening to Coach Dewey, if he's not listening to me, he needs to find somebody to connect with that he can listen to. So in that same weekend, I gave him like four or five phone numbers. I hooked him up with John Crouch. This is all like via group chat. I got him John Crouch's number, uh, text Coach Crouch, hey, can Kevin come out and train for a week? He did. Coach Whitman, Coach Montoya, and all these guys. And he already knew Faraz from a, from a different relationship from prior relationship. So, um, and then when the th- whole thing kind of hit on Rogan, it was like, it was like Rogan's idea that he goes and trains elsewhere. And I did have a problem with the way that it was worded. I felt like it kind of shit on the gym in a way, um, or the coaches that he did have where, you know, for me, man, I just want to see the guy win. I love the guy to death. I want him to be successful at whatever camp that it may be. So him and I have always remained close. I still talk to him. As a matter of fact, like when he fought uh, Gregor, him and I were going over stuff in the parking lot while he was at TriStar and I was at Extreme Couture. Like we're still very, very close. I wrote him today. Um, so with, with the outcome of the fight, man, it you know he just anything can happen at this at this level in the UFC when you have a number next to your name for sure, right? Anybody at any time can beat the next guy. Um, I was. Obviously bummed that he missed weight. I've been there before when the Barboza fight, we missed weight by like 
This one is a little bit more. Um, there are some things that I don't know maybe could have affected him in the travel. I know when you go out of the country, a lot of the water, when you water load, has a lot of sodium in it. I don't know if they accounted for those things. I'm not sure. I'm just I'm really not sure. Um, but overall, man, I'm just I'm just bummed for the guy. I pull for him. Um, moreover, because we do have that fraternity and that connection with Coach Wallace, and I just want to see that dude succeed. But were you surprised afterwards that he was telling some media that we may not see him fight for a while? No, I wasn't surprised because I mean I was in the I was in the suture room when we were um, getting stitched up with, against RDA and he, you know he has true emotions you know and we were we were, we were mic'd up for I think that show Destin and a little bit a little bit of, of it got leaked and you know Kevin Kevin holds a lot in you know and he and you might not know him as well uh, as what he perceives out in the public eye he's a really really good dude he's a really deep guy. Um, I, I always am a little bit surprised of the way he handles himself in public because I, I know the real Kevin Lee and, um, no, I'm not surprised he, he takes those losses very heavy. Uh, I wish he would kind of be in the middle of that, not run so high on the wins and not so low on the losses, but somewhere right in the middle. So I think just in a couple of days time, he'll, he'll, he'll feel a little bit better about the situation and get back on the horse. But the good news is he is still very young. Very, yeah, Absolutely. Time's on his side, but speaking of someone who's got kind of more of an even keel approach, a veteran in the game, someone that trains at the gym, Joe Benavidez, mm -hmm. I know he had that heartbreaking loss. Uh, what's been the communication that you had with him since that fight card over um, Norfolk? Yeah, just just that. Uh, I wrote him I wrote him the night of. Um, actually, I wrote him right before the fight. We had a little bit back and forth. Uh, I wrote him after the loss. Just told him I loved him. You know, sometimes you just, just got to be... Just throw something out there for him, and then uh, the next day I wrote him a little lengthy, lengthy text, uh, just along the lines of that. You know, I don't, I don't know really what to say in this situation, but I just want to say something and kind of elaborated a few things uh, of of what he's done for me and our, our team and the way he presents himself. And um, he was very receptive to that, but at the same time, he said some things that actually made a lot of sense to me too. He's like, "Man, this is all nice, and I appreciate it, but you know, I just want to be." great at what I work so hard for, you know, and that's to be the best in the world at 125. You know, he goes, I love being the, the nice guy and everybody loves me and this, this and that. But, you know, I also want to be the best in the world at what I put so much time and effort in for. So th th it did resonate, man. It, it hit. So he's a, he's an unbelievable guy. I think, I think the overall general consensus of the MMA world was pulling for him to win that fight. Yeah. And, and it didn't happen, but he's also one of those Coach Falls carryover guys and and I you know we all believe in him wholeheartedly and I think he's going to get another shot at this. Yeah, weren't there rumors or they were trying to make that rematch happen? Yeah, I, I think and I think it's going to happen. You know, the uh, Figueroa misses weight by how much he did. Um, you know, the headbutt does happen. That's an incidental thing. And you know, to be quite honest with you, it's it's something that was led on by Joe. Joe leads with his head all the time. So the headbutt was was although incidental, it did affect the fight. And the bottom line, this guy missed weight by two and a half pounds, and there's no there's no champ. And in my mind, there's there's probably nobody else better than Joe to to, to actually fight for that as far as a rematch goes. And I do want to set the record straight. Extreme Couture is one of the best MMA gyms in this country because when a lot of the fighters come out here, they don't all just train and flock to the UFC PI. I know there's a lot of amazing fighters that come to your gym. I know a couple of weeks ago, Wiley Zhang was over there too, yeah, the training, there. the champ. She's been training there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. So you guys opened your door to a lot of different fighters. Um, kind of, How did that kind of precedent start where you get a lot of different people and a lot of different minds coming in there and opening the mats to such great people? Well... When, I mean, I've been at Extreme Couture since day one, and we've had a lot of different uh, gym managers during that time. And I remember when I believe it was Faber and Dominic Cruz were both coaches for the Ultimate Fighter, and Faber's team came in to the gym to 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 train for that two weeks or whatever it was. And the gym manager, gym manager at the time uh, tried to charge everybody like twenty five dollars for a, for a day pass, like Uriah Faber and his whole camp. And in my mind, it's like, dude, these are this is a future Hall of Famer, one of the best in the world. His team is unbelievable. We should be allowing these guys to come in and train and spread their knowledge. And furthermore, it, it breeds excitement in the team. You know, this is new blood. These are new guys. Let's let's have them come in and train for free. So I, I always kind of remember that as a sticking point for me when I took over the gym. Um, you know, I do charge some people. 
I don't have to, I run a business. But at the end of the day, I look at it like this is an investment for the rest of the guys and girls on the mats. You know, they're able to to train with new people. We've made it to the point where back in the heyday when it, when you were new and came in the gym, like the Jay Herons and Mike Piles of the world weren't green lighting you and beating the shit out of you. So we changed that that culture within the gym and became a little bit more open door. And I think that that's the reason why you're starting to see it now. More and more people feel comfortable in coming in and knowing that they're just not going to come in to get hurt or cut for, for some reason or need in the head for some reason just because they're new. So for just for that reason alone, we've seen more and more the influx of uh, these great fighters coming through. And even Jessica I. Uh, how is she doing? Any update with her? She's doing great. I talk to her. I, I talk to her pretty much every day via text or, or we'll call. Um, her arm's doing much better. She should be getting cleared this week. Uh, and although with what's going on with everything with the coronavirus, she'll probably stay at, have to stay at home. Uh, I just got word that the PI is going to be closed till the thirtieth, I believe. So you know, it's just it's just one one day at a time. But with her rehab and everything that she's been doing, she's right on track, and she'll be back here soon. So yeah, and uh, I mean I can only imagine how devastated Francis has to be. I know he's put in a lot of work in these past eight weeks. Yeah. What do you think, if you had to speculate, finger in the wind, what's next step for for him and what the UFC can, can do? Do you think they're going to try to compile a lot of different fights on this April 18th card? If if the April 18th card is still going to happen, uh, I guess what, what do you think is going to happen next? That's a great way to look at it. I didn't think of it that way, where maybe you take, you're taking the main events and the co-main events and put it on one big big card that would be amazing if that were to happen um you know I, I i don't know how he's feeling i know how i'm feeling about it um you know he's put a lot of work in and the one thing that i was super impressed with uh, a few weeks ago we were we were doing something man and, and on my saturdays you guys have been to some of my saturday practices where it's more mma cardio and they're tough practices and it's something that he's almost embraced. He, he's embraced that grind. And he said something to me very interesting that I, I really, really love to hear. He said, you know what, man? Like, I'm not overlooking Jarzinho by any means at all, but I'm looking to get better at everything and every piece of my craft for the next couple fights that I have. Like, I want to I be better because I know eventually I'm going to either fight DC or Stipe. So I want to use this time to get better at everything. You know, he didn't want to leave any stone unturned. So I was very impressed with his work ethic and, you know, absolutely love the guy. He's got a huge heart. You guys have been around him a number of times. So, you know, I'm pulling for the guy. Uh, hopefully we get something here soon. And can you confirm he's got the heaviest hands you've ever <laughs> held pads for? 100%, you know. I mean, Ray Seffo will argue that, but... Um, it, there's a little bit of difference in the way the way that he hits. Uh, we went and sparred with uh, Joe Joyce last Monday. I saw that photo. Yeah. And, I mean, Francis did an unbelievable job against one of the best boxers in the world. And, uh, you know, a lot of the boxing coaches that were there, pure boxing coaches, were blown away at how athletic and how well he did just straight boxing. Um, we did some things there that were, were very MMA-esque. You know, he started switching stances and doing some other stuff that most boxers aren't accustomed to. And, um, you know, he's just a super freak athlete. So, you know, he's, uh, he's just one of those guys that has that championship mindset. Yeah, and hopefully, I mean, like you said, they'll, you know, hopefully figure something out soon and we'll see April 18th, right? Hopefully that card still remains intact. Right, hopefully. But even uh, you mentioned Indian reservations is a possible location. I, I think they're banning everything in California. Does that still account for Indian reservations in like a California or a state of Arizona if they did ban things like restaurants and all public places? That's a great question. I think they kind of you know lead by their own rules. From what my understanding, I, I I don't I don't know the answer to that. But when I heard that. They were going to try to move it somewhere. That was the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, possibly an Indian reservation, you know? So I, I don't know all, all the bylaws with that, but, I mean, if it is a possibility, I'm sure Dana's going to explore that option. But during this time as well, like, what advice would you give Francis or Cody, like, guys who have trained so hard and have these fights coming up, and then, unfortunately, you know, all this is happening? Like, what can you tell them during this time? Well... No one can take away the hard work we put in. And although we're not m maybe fighting the time that we're expected to fight, it is sweat equity. We put in a lot of hard work. And it's going to show no matter what that date is. So although right now I, I, I'm, we're all upset, I get that. But again, like I was saying earlier, it's, it's bigger than us. It's bigger than, than just us fighting. This is, a, this is a worldwide epidemic that we're going to have to deal with. 
And I think just trying to stay positive, like you're saying earlier in the show and um, being supportive of one another, you know, it's, it affects everybody. So I think that's just really it. I mean, the hard work is put in and we, we did a great job and no one can take that away from us. Do you think you would hold kind of private sessions, one-off basis for specific fighters if they requested it um, mm -hmm. at the gym? What's your take on doing that if, if that's even a necessary step? I mean, I planned on it. Uh, uh, as of last night when we closed the gym down, I wrote Francis and Cody Stamen and just said, whatever we need to get done ourselves, I'll make sure that we have the training partners and the facility open to do that. So as of last night, what we had thought was, okay, if we need to, we can use Extreme Couture or we can use the PI um, I had a list of guys already on on hold, Tim Johnson, a few other heavyweights that were already willing to come in and spar and train with us for the next week because that's all we really need is, is, is this last week and then the next week would have been fight week. So, uh, and same goes for Cody. Like we already had our guys set up. We already had everything what we needed to do and kind of planned on how to finish up the rest of this week. Um, and then if, if he calls me right now and says, hey, bro, we're going to go hit pads. I'm there. We're going to go hit pads. We're going we're gonna to work, so. Uh, yeah, we definitely really appreciate you coming by. I know you have children at home. Yeah. We've got to go spend some father time with them. They have some school off and everything like that. Yeah. And we really appreciate you giving us the update. The fight fans really appreciate it. And uh, keep doing your thing. And we'll <laughs> obviously we want, we want to be involved as quickly as possible. For sure. See you guys fight. Come back in the gym. We yeah. appreciate you. No, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Of course. Of course. Eric Nixick, head coach, Extreme Couture. Thank, Thank you for you. stopping in yeah, for the show guys. zone. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Air high five. Air high oh, five. Yeah. That's what we got to do. <laughs> the knuckles. Right? Yes. Air high five. I guess we'll continue with the podcast and, and keep <laughs> yeah. going and everything like that. Eric, we'll be in touch, man. All right, Stay yeah, safe out there. Hope to see there. you soon. Yeah, that, that, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Nixick. I know. Great guy. Always love catching up with him or bumping into him at gyms when we're working out. Yes, he, he's always been amazing accommodating to us when yeah. we go there because a lot of the stuff that we do is boots on the ground going to the gyms directly we've always coordinated with him he's got a lot of great fighters in that gym yes hosting a lot of great fighters as, as i brought up a few minutes ago coming in and out um appreciate him taking the time right I after know. a meeting with randy couture and what they're going to do with the gym i know i just like you said i mean we're all trying to be positive but i just can't help but feel just so bad and just heartbroken for everyone it's different i mean this isn't team sports it's not baseball basketball football there's no union that uh, you eat what you kill and these guys need to fight in order to make money these coaches need their fighters to fight in order to make money you just heard eric you know eight week training camp like he's not expecting a penny from francis it's not like francis got paid to give him any percentage or any pennies of what he'll make so it, it's really an unfortunate situation for everybody, but the best thing we can do as human beings is to stay positive. Help one another. Help one another. Do not panic. Do not take all of the toilet paper at the grocery stores. You can always just use a wipe, use a paper towel. I mean, come on. Food and Napkins. water <laughs> are much more of necessities. But also some people I know, like I had a friend of mine say he couldn't find like chicken right or beef but um when you called one of the grocery stores the other day they said kind of a helpful tip that maybe some people uh, may be able to use is to unfortunately you have to wake up early but to get there right when the store opens ah, so right? now and you're that's giving the public did. my little secrets oh, it's okay so, no it's totally no, fine I, we're sharing I sharing help is caring people you, know, I, you because said it and i agree I felt bad honestly just uh that's the word of advice get to your grocery stores early get to them maybe 15 20 minutes before they open they probably already have a line they but... probably already have a line but if you want to get your stuff i mean they're not going to restock later in the day later at night they're gonna you know was who do we call it? trader joe's trader yeah. joe's yeah so yeah so um to get you know even the some something simple like bread right because right. the other day we went to another grocery store by our place and they were out of everything in the bread aisle and situations extreme situations like this remind you not to take the little simple things for granted yes and to also just take what you need right yeah and even if you have maybe your grandparents or even your parents who may be a bit up there in age i guess um to also see if you could help them go shop so they don't have to leave the house or anything 
Definitely. Well, we're optimistic people. We have no idea what the next hour, couple hours, next days have in store, but we're going to show up here to the studio and keep doing the Schmozone podcast as much as we can, as much as possible. I'll be loyal to to the Schmo sponsors and, um, you know, Frontier Jackson, CBD for the Schmo keeps me calm. I take these things. They help with my recovery. I like it. And um, you just got to be positive in situations like this and read books, stay educated. Yeah. You know, just do things that you'd normally always say to yourself, ah, oh, man, I wish I could do this, but I don't have enough time. Well, no, you got plenty of time. Right. Writing, of writing time. Mandarin. Writing Mandarin for yeah. you, polishing up on those skills. Yeah. Cleaning. Well, I do that every Sunday anyway. And just to clarify for the people, because I know we've had a lot of these episodes now where there's so much more we could talk about us that we haven't had the opportunity because we've had guests come in. But yes, you do a lot of the cleaning, but I do do cleaning too. Like for all those people, <laughs> I do my own laundry, right, Helen? I do my own laundry, Helen. At least be okay, honest with the people. Yeah. Well, did I ever say you did it? I clean dishes too. No, I scrub all the toilets and the skid marks. I'm just kidding. Yeah, you have a lot of skid marks. Yeah, what can I say? No, but you're a great cook. You just made some tuna salad yesterday. It tasted amazing. I do all the dishes, but shared I it with your parents too. Yes, and yeah, they they, like they my, said it's amazing. They like my tuna salad. Yeah, it's really good with pita chips. But I literally finished the whole bag yesterday, or yeah. no, today. Well, well the crumbs today. But no, I feel to add to what you were saying that I feel like we do a great job of 50-50, right? Just helping each other out, just being a great team. Even if I'm cleaning, you obviously are a better cook than me. That is true. But, you know, we always just try to find ways to help each other out. As they say, teamwork makes the dream work, Helen. Yes. And you did turn 30 a few days ago. I know you didn't want... I. <laughs> I know you did not want that to happen. Hey, listen, everybody. This guy over here turned 30 during the whole coronavirus craze, okay? On Friday the 13th. On Friday the 13th. We did get to go to the Hoover Dam, but we had to put a squad douche to the plan of going to Horseshoe Bend. I know. The weather, the yeah. situation. We were supposed to go to L.A. last week, too, we and were. do some interviews, but obviously what's going on right now... Um, health and safety health first. Health and safety first. Did you like your custom schmo cake, though? The custom schmo cake was amazing. Uh, a lot of frosting, but the cake that was amazing. <laughs> no, we ate it. I know. That was the frosting that gets you that instant sugar high, where you start getting jittery. Or is that does that only happen to me? All I know is you were bouncing off the walls nonstop for like three hours. Couldn't get you to go to sleep that night. That is true. Well, I was thinking about a lot of things, you know. Of course, very preoccupied. We yeah. do plan on having a second guest today. We brought him up, uh, number 11th ranked UFC Bantamweight, Cody, Cody Stamen. Stamen. Trains with Eric Nixick. Yes, coming it, off of a draw against Song Yes, Yadong. we were there in Washington, D.C. Song Yadong, who I believe is ranked number 11th. Um, yeah, and he, you know, if you ask Cody, we'll, we'll bring that up with him too, obviously, because he was supposed to be on that March 28th Columbus fight card. Um, he just got the news today, too. I'm sure he was training at the UFCPI when they told him, hey, we're closing this thing down to the end of the month. I believe that's what Dana White's yeah. letter said. The UFC is officially closing down shop till the end of the month, March 31st. I believe their employees will be working from home. The UFCPI will be closed. Tough times. I know, but... For all those who are tuning in right now, um, we greatly appreciate it. We hope, you know, that you guys are staying safe, staying healthy, trying to be positive. We will get through this together. 100%. And it's weird because I look at sports as an escape. And to see no sports on television, to see March Madness get canceled, the NBA season being put on hold, Major League Baseball season being put on hold, NHL being put on hold, the NFL draft, they it's going to go on, but they're not going to have any live events with spectators. Very, very difficult times we're in, and sports is an escapism, so we will do our best to interview all the fighters that want to be interviewed, to continue to live our lives on a modified schedule, mm -hmm. and just try to put a smile and entertainment into this world as 
much as possible. Exactly. And of course, you know, like always, we're very grateful for your support and we hope to try to entertain them, right? Of course. During the, these tough times. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just so much going on. It, it's kind of hard to digest and process everything at once. Definitely. And, you know, from what I said earlier about eat, you eat what you kill from what the fighters do to monetize and make money. Same thing for us. You know, we run our own business. So um, we just have to be creative. We have to be optimistic and strategize. And that's what we're doing. But Helen, I do want to ask you, I, we might as well, until hmm. uh, Cody gets here, we might as well tell the audience, like, your start in sports. You know, you worked as a cocktail waitress. Uh, yeah. You paid money to get radio time at Lotus Broadcasting. Mm -hmm. um, hardest struggles you've had to overcome to get to this point. Yeah, well, I'll never forget it. And that happened December 2015 when I hit my rock bottom. Uh, went through like two health scares. Like, um, I mean, I don't want to talk and give it all away like what it was but it was very very serious um yeah i went through that loss didn't have any money basically uh was living out of this tiny room that i was renting out um and i remember during that time i would just stare at my ceiling for weeks uh not knowing what to do and i would tell myself okay i need to because at that time i was still paying for eyes on the game um and how that works for those who may not really understand was at the time so i created eyes on the game um because of trying to overcome my um fear of speaking as you could see or some people may be like oh she talks kind of slow i know but um so i hated speaking growing up very shy but always loved sports was a former swimmer so sports i could talk about but um, I created Eyes on the Game to try to overcome that fear um, because at the time I couldn't even look at any um, anyone at the drive through any cashier, couldn't make eye contact with people, just like super awkward and very scared of just other people, I guess. I, I would just break out in sweat. So um, at the time when I created that show, I my own show, I um, had to pay and buy time on air. Um, so December 2015, and that's when I finally quit my day job because when I turned 21, I was a cocktail waitress. So I would work graveyard shifts like 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., then study sports during the daytime. Um, and so during that time, I was just, you know, trying to say live off my savings, uh, went through some health scares. Um, didn't even know how to pay rent, but I told myself if anything's going first, it's going to be the food. So I was living off those saltine crackers, the uh, great value ones that you buy a big box of uh, at Walmart. And then, you know, just kind of living off that for a month. And then I volunteered, fed the homeless, and that really gave me, you know, it gave me um, hope. And that actually is a big uh, thing that I credit for helping me get through everything. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That's the Helen Yee story. In so, a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell. So if you think you're going through rough times right now, which we all are, Helen, you had to struggle through that. Even when, you know, the economy was booming and we didn't have yeah. a health scare. And sleeping in my car. So and sleeping it teaches in your car. you a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yes, the perseverance. But uh, without further ado, we have the number 11th ranked UFC Bantamweight in the world, Cody Stamen in the flesh, here on the Schmozone podcast. We just had... Uh, Coach Eric Nixick in here a few oh, minutes ago too. Thanks for awesome. joining us, man. Awesome, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I uh, I'm just coming from the PI. Uh, I got some pretty tough news on the way here. I mean, I'm sure you guys know, fights are postponed. The PI is closing. Um, like I literally just found out like as I was coming here. So uh, crazy. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. And you know. Uh, I walked in on your story. You're talking about, you know, all the things you're going through. And I, mean, I just, honestly, I just, I feel for, like, I want to be selfish and, and feel sorry for myself because I'm not fighting. And I put all that effort and energy into, you know, preparing for a fight and not being able to do it. But, man, I'm not the only one. So many people are going through so much shit right now. And it's, uh, 
it's really, really sad. You know, I'm a fighter, but I'm also a businessman. I own a restoration business in Michigan, and our phones aren't ringing. Like, we're just, like no one is working. You know, all of our government jobs are shut down. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, a crazy time. Crazy time. So you're literally one of the last, if not the last, fighters to work out at the UFCPI before they shut down, I guess, for the first time ever in yeah. the history of the UFCPI. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like, they just found out that we were playing a game of spike ball, and, like, they had just got the email. Like, I, I literally we got done playing spike ball after a workout and walked in, and they're like, yeah, we're closing down. I'm like, holy crap, this is happening. And, man, we were at your last fight, too, in D.C. Yeah. against Song Yudong and... It was a draw, and I know that was not it's controversial. And I know you were eager to get back into it in mm -hmm. Columbus, March twenty eighth, and to see that you know just go right between your hands because you thought they would move it here to Vegas, and then the Nevada State Athletic Commission had that ruling uh, where they're suspending all activity until at least March twenty fifth, where they'd meet for another meeting. Right. You guys have just been in limbo. What was communication like with the boss, man Dana White, prior to finding this out today? So, I mean, I feel like everyone is finding things out at the exact same time. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's minute by minute, hour by hour right now. I mean, things are changing so fast. Uh, we kind of had a little bit of an inclination that this was going to happen, obviously, with everything else that's happening. Like, but, I mean, I'm pretty happy to be part of an organization that's literally still trying to do everything they can to get their athletes into the cage you know what I mean? Because that's how we all make a living. That's how. That's how. You know, we're not we're not basketball players on a salary. We're not getting paid unless we're getting in there and fighting. So I mean, for them to scramble and do everything they had to do, and I'm sure you know how much work it honestly took, and maybe kind of seeming like right now it's for nothing because these fights are going to get postponed anyways. But I mean, I think it's awesome that Dana White and everyone they're just doing everything that they absolutely po possibly could have to make sure that you know, we had every opportunity to, to potentially fight and uh, obviously didn't work out, but that's out of their control. But do you know, um, did they tell you anything as far as would you guys still be, be getting paid or how any of that would work? Yeah, so I was just talking with my manager uh, as I was walking here. I'm sure we're going to get compensated somehow. Obviously, it's not going to be the same as, you know, the fight or the show money, but um, we're, we're going to be compensated. The UFC is good about, you know, taking care of their athletes in times like this. Uh but it's it's more for me, you know. Screw the money. I I wanted to fight. You know, I wanted to get back in there. Like you're saying that 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 last one, that's a pretty dirty taste in my mouth. I just wanted to get that over with. And you know, like how much time and energy you spend in preparation for a fight. Like the last ten weeks of my life have just been just revolved around you know twenty the twenty eighth. Everything you know, everything you do, your sleep, your 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 diet, everything. You know, I cut a ton of weight. There's so much that goes in. I've had. You know, I've been flying guys in from all over the place and staying at my house, you know, for basically the last two months uh, to prepare for this fight. And, you know, I, I don't want to say that's all for nothing because there's always there's always good things that come out of out of out of tough times like this. But uh, right now it's kind of like, damn, you know, kind of kind of like still in that in that place where I'm like, uh, I don't really you know, I haven't really had time to process or think about, you know, everything. But. Yeah, that's life. You just got to keep going. So just to clarify, you woke up this morning thinking that you would be fighting mm -hmm. March twenty eighth. I did. I did two workouts today already. Yeah, I woke up and uh, woke up did an interview uh, for the UFC. I went and worked out. I drilled for an hour, did a half hour cardio, then I did my strength conditioning workout. After strength conditioning, we were playing spike ball, kind of cooling off. I was planning on working out again here at five, and uh, I just got that news. Who are you playing spike ball with? Uh, Bo Sandoval, Julian, uh, Marquez, and, uh, AJ, uh, yeah, it was a really good game. We won. I mean, so that's... Hey, some victory today, <laughs> yeah, right? I, I did win at Spike Ball, so... <laughs> Multi-talented. But before this, did they kind of give you guys a sense of where the fight was going to be at, or where they were trying to move it to? So, I mean, obviously the Apex was the, the obvious choice, and, and that's kind of what everyone was saying. Like, yeah, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be fighting at the Apex. But, you, like, there's always that lingering thought. You're watching everything get closed down around you. You're watching, you know, all these things happening. You go to the grocery store and everything's gone. Like, you're like, uh, am I, am I still fighting? Like, what in the hell? Like, if it does happen, like, I mean, that's like, you have to, like, as an athlete, you have to literally stay in that, 
like you can't let those things get to you uh you know before you 100 percent know for sure you're not fighting otherwise you know i can't just decide like oh well you know i'm probably not fighting so i'm gonna stop working out and stop you know stop my diet right now I, it, that wasn't really an option for me so like i said i like I, I did two workouts today in preparation for my fight uh, the 28th, and I'm just, that's not going to happen. And uh, from your side of things, was your coaches and that supporting staff uh, travel for them? Was this ever not an option to come? Were they all in as well? Or do you think from the grapevine uh, that you've heard from other fighters, those tough to round up coaches and everything with everything going on? Yeah, so uh, luckily my coaches are here, right? And they were... they. Uh, Eddie Baracco, Casey Halstead, they both said, they're like, we're going to Ohio. They're like, fuck the coronavirus. We're going to Ohio. We don't care. Like, we're, we're going to go. Uh, Darren Crookshank, uh, back in Michigan, just had a just had a, a baby girl, really young kid, and I just told him, I was like, dude, listen, I want you there, but it doesn't make sense for you to be there. You know, it's bigger than fighting. It's not worth you going, potentially catching something. And he was like, yeah, 100% agree. I, I think I should be with my family right now. So he wasn't going to come. Uh, but I was maybe going to have my brother, but then I was also like, man, I, do I really want, I, do I really want to endanger anyone else? So I was at the point where I was like, you know, I'm probably just going to have just my two local coaches come and maybe a local training partner corner me as well. Like I, I just like, I don't want to be responsible for, you know, something like that happening. And that's like a, one of those weird choices that I never imagined I'd ever have to make, you know, as an athlete being like, yeah, I don't want to put any of my, you know, friends or family at risk. Like I don't want anyone to go. Like, stay home, watch the fight from home. But I know they mentioned the next three UFC cards are canceled, I believe, up through Portland. Uh, as of right now, as far as we know, um, UFC 249 is still uh, intact. On the table. Cross yeah, your and, fingers. Yeah. Um, according to, so on Twitter, they said on Sports Center, Dana White referring to Habib versus Tony. Quote, this fight is going to happen. Probably not in the U.S., but this fight is going to happen. With that be something that could interest you maybe even moving your fight to that card if it still is intact absolutely yeah i mean if if that's if that's a possibility i would absolutely i would absolutely take that take that offer i mean just this is like we're speculating i mean we're I was just talking with some of the staff at the pi and they're like listen there's like 3 weeks in may when there's like a little bit of opening that's probably most likely when they would reschedule um i thought maybe at first, they would just push it back a week because uh, the April 4th, that weekend, there's no fight. I thought maybe they'd push mine back and kind of wait for Nevada to kind of rule things out the 25th to figure out what the hell's going on. Uh, obviously, that's not going to happen. Uh, but if if cards start getting separated, you know, if you know they're throwing two more fights on April 18th, I would definitely put my name in the hat to you know be one of those be one of those people. Yeah, so what do those next steps look like? You have obviously are training hard. You're in amazing shape. Are you going to do everything you can to maintain that? How long will you maintain that? What's your window look like right now? So it, it's it's almost impossible to maintain that level of focus and like, discipline when you're not sure what's going on. I mean, for me, uh, I think the best thing I could do is just kind of take two, three days to unwind you know, be at home the way I'm supposed to be at home, like everybody else. Uh, you know, uh, I was wasn't one of those people that went and stockpiled toilet paper, but uh, you know, I think I have enough things that I can survive in my own house for a couple of months at least. You know, if I if, if something happens to where they like they're not letting anyone travel or do anything. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I just you, just like everybody else. You know, I got to take it day by day. And you're a woodsman. You can build your own stuff, too. Cause That's when right. I was looking around here. I'm like, I gotta, you know, I got to build something for this. Yeah, we, we'd love that because, uh, you know, the time I interviewed you, I believe it was in Minnesota, I was the yeah. schmo, man. It's a little different talking to me than yeah. the schmo a little yeah. bit, maybe. Yeah, a little bit. I, honestly, uh, I'd, I'd watch your stuff, but we were talking just like this. And then as soon as the camera came on, you changed. And I was like, oh. Like I, I wasn't ready. For, I wasn't ready for <laughs> yeah, it. I, I wasn't ready for it. And someone told me, he's like, "Hey, you know, this is this is gonna happen." And I kind of blew it off, and then it happened. And I was kind of <laughs> the reaction I, I was it. looking for. Me I too, love man. It. It's perfect. Got to yeah. keep you guys on your toes, no, right? Yeah, absolutely. It Get does the same generic stuff over and over again. No, yeah, Spice it up. Yeah, no, you do a really good job. I mean, you do a really good job promoting MMA in a different way, and I think that's you know why you you guys have been so successful. I was Appreciate gonna that. say. Is it more weird to talk to him like this now than no. it is the schmo? <laughs> no, 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 no. 
if right now he just busted out the schmo, like threw the glasses on and just busted out the schmo, I might be kind of uh, scared again. You should do <laughs> that in, in a future I th- I th- episode. I th- just like randomly, just come off. back from the bathroom. Yeah, I think you're totally giving different. you're giving me ideas to do. I think <laughs> the last episode we had last week, we had Paula Costa in here mm. downstairs. I was the schmo. And then we brought him upstairs, and I did this whole thing, and I kind of threw him off guard a little bit. We played that. Um, but I think that'd be really cool to, like, uh, do it on the spot. You're giving me ideas now. Yeah, yeah. I think I like that idea. Just don't do it to me. I'm not ready for it. I'm not mentally prepared for it right now. Uh, Paul Acosta, you're working out with Logan Paul. Yeah. Dude. I was there. That was you, cool. you were in the... I was oh, there. Perfect. So, was cool. yeah, yeah. What, what about that Did he really knock video? him out? I don't think he knocked him out. Um... It, it seemed like everything leading up, uh, they were kicking us out. They were like telling us we had to leave. Like the Who's the, P, the PI was because okay. everything was supposed to be closed at one, and those guys showed up, and the PI was like, "We want to kick them out, but we can't," kind of thing. Um, but I'm like, I'm just gonna leave. But everything before I left was like they weren't really gonna do anything crazy. Like it was just gonna be like a like Paul Acosta was wrapping Logan Paul's hands and. It was very friendly. Everything seemed like it was going to be more of like a like a tra- like they were just going to train. Nothing crazy was going to happen. And then, you know, who knows? Who knows what really happened? Well, I, I know Paulo came here with a fat lip. Um, so I know he got clipped, and he, I know he wasn't wearing any mouth guard or headgear. I know Logan was wearing headgear. The video shows that, but. Did you see the that that post that he did of him getting knocked out? Uh-uh. I question if that was legit yeah, or not. Was it real or was fake? it real or fake? Just the way he felt it didn't seem Just seem real. Everything leading up to that, I would say that would be one hundred percent fake. Yeah, one hundred percent fake. I mean, like they weren't acting like two guys that were going to knock each other out. They were acting like two guys that were being friendly and were doing some social media shit. It wasn't like a, you know what I mean? There's a different energy when two guys are going to kill each other than when you know they're going to hang out and. You know, have a little little light sparring session, a little touch butt in the park. There he is, Cody Stamen debunking yeah. these rumors that Got the you know, there's a knockout, scoop. the inside <laughs> scoop there. Yeah. It, 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 the PI is a crazy place because literally you have absolutely no idea who is going to walk in that place. Yeah. I mean, Aljamain Sterling, Henry Cejudo, guys that are potential opponents, guys that you fought before mm-hmm. are, are walking in and out. What's the uh, relationship like? When that happens, so I mean, it's 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 like one of those places uh, that you do, you don't really look to have conflict with anyone. I mean, Aljamain Stanley and I don't have any like personal issues. Like, we never went to that level where it was personal. It was just like, it was like surface talk. You no, know, I wasn't like threatening his family or doing anything crazy like that. So, when the fight was over, everything was over. So uh, him and I could have a conversation. We could be in the same room. It would be one hundred percent fine. But some of these guys. Like, they really do have to kind of go out of their way to, like, make sure these guys aren't walking by each other. And that's, like, one of the real, like, the struggles of the PI is that it's really a confined space. It's not very big. And you will get three, four guys that are in the same weight class. Like, literally, I walked upstairs, and there was, like, four or five guys in my weight class all working out at the same time. And I was like, this is so awkward. You know what I mean? These are guys that could potentially be fighting, like, and everyone's kind of got this weird, there's, like, this weird energy. It's like, we're not supposed to be in the same place together. But they opened up the Apex now, too. Yep. Um, did you Have you done any training there? I know during the McGregor fight card uh, yeah. in January, they were, the Cowboy was there, or Connor was there, and the other one was at the other place. You, yeah, you so, work out there, too? Yeah, so I've, I've, I've been there. I've worked out there a couple times. Um, it's easier to work out at the PI, honestly. It's kind of a pain in the butt to go over to the Apex, but uh, unbelievable facility. It's like the PI on steroids. It's insane. Um, but that was kind of the like one of the main reasons why they have that gym there, so that they can keep guys separate during fight weeks and stuff. But I think more than that, I think the Apex is going to be like a multi-sport facility where they have like, you know, like that's where a, a boxing guy would come to his camp, or you know, football players will get ready for the draft, things like that. I think it's going to be like it's going to it's going to reach a lot more sports. It's going to be more than just MMA over there. I think that's the long-term goal, uh, and they're going to have like hotels and stuff as well for athletes but kind of circling back to the bantamweight division what's your thoughts on henry cejudo jose aldo oh well i think obviously aljamain sterling that should have been his fight aljamain sterling's hurt right so would do they run it back does the ufc run uh marlon and cejudo too or do they do aldo you know or peter yan i don't think peter yan fighting your eye favor i don't think that's a the, I don't think that fight gets him a title. 
Uh, so in, in my eyes, it was it was a process of elimination. You got one guy that already fought him. You got another guy that's hurt. And you have one guy that's like one of the best pound for pound guys in the world. Like those are those are and he's it's a pretty easy sell for the UFC. I mean, I thought Aldo was the obvious choice, and I just think that the average fan doesn't didn't understand like that process to get, of getting there. Obviously, you know, has he like really earned his spot at 135? No, I mean Aldo hasn't, but the guy's earned his spot. Like he can go to 55 and get a title shot because he's like. He's Jose Aldo, you know. He's like one of the absolute best guys in the in the world at every weight class. He's one of the most well known fighters and one of the guys that built the UFC. How do you see that fight going down between Peter Yan and uh, Marlon Marias? Peter Yan, Marlon Marias. I think Marlon Marias is going to beat him. Um, you know, I don't know. Peter Yan is like the wild card. Peter Yan really is the wild card. Like I don't honestly know how good he is. I know how good Marlon Marias is. So just based on the facts I have. Like, and having seen, you know, Marlon beat really tough guys, uh, I think Marlon wins the fight. I mean, Peter Yan had a really close fight with Jimmy Riviera, and I, I, and look at what Marlon Marias did to Jimmy. Like, you know, I don't know. I think, I think Marlon is just, he's one of the more big, bigger, physical, scarier guys at 135. Like, I, if I had to choose who to fight, I would rather fight Peter Yan than Marlon Marias. It's definitely an exciting time to be a bantamweight right yeah, now. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, the bantamweight division, like, from the time I got into the UFC, like, the bantamweight wasn't it wasn't half what it is now. You know what I mean? I was in the top ten in a year. It wasn't like not like like the uh, Edgar Aldo. All, none of these people were there. You know, Corey Sanhagen, Peter Yan. None of these people existed. Like this all happened like within the last year, and it's absolutely insane. And you know, to like get, like see my name in the mix with all these guys, it's just like. It's it's surreal to me. But do you think that Henry beats Jose? No. No, I don't. I don't see how he would. Ho- Jose Aldo is uh, like one of the li- literally he's he's one he's he- humongous. Henry's not very big. I mean, you're going to there's going to be a significant size difference on fight night. Uh Aldo, Jose Aldo f- can fight for 5 rounds. Um and you know Cejudo's not going to be able to take Jose Aldo down and hold him down for his life. I mean, you like you see a guy like Chad Mendez. Like I've trained with Chad Mendez, and like the fact that Chad Mendez couldn't hold Jose Aldo down, that is unbelievable. Chad Mendez is literally one of the most explosive, strong people I've ever seen in my life. That guy's a freak. And the fact that Jose Aldo was doing the things to him that he did, like that's amazing. And Jose Aldo is a scary dude at 135. Where do you stand on the Sugar Sean O'Malley hype train? I know we hadn't seen him in a couple of years. He's getting those quick knockouts. Um, I'm sure that's a name you're going to hear a lot in this division. When he beats somebody that anybody ha- knows, I, I will, I will, I, I will take back everything negative I've said about the guy. But I just think there's a million ways to beat that guy. You know, if his name popped up. Like, I, I already told my manager, if his name ever pops up in a conversation, I don't even send me the contract, sign it for me, and just tell me when we're fighting. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that he's a threat. I mean, if, if you, you're you talking about, like, fighting Sugar Sean or fighting Marlon Marias or Jose Aldo, you know, or, or Henry Cejudo, like I, don't, like, I wouldn't even put him on the, I wouldn't even put him on the same list. I mean, he hasn't even cracked the top 15. He hasn't beat anybody. I mean, most of the guys he's beat are you know, either on their way out or out of the UFC already. So in my eyes, like, you know, he's still beating, you know, regional level guys and he's doing it. He looks good doing it, but it's like, uh, you know what I mean? If they, they were feeding me these guys, like I promise you, I could look good beating him too. It's, 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 there's levels. And until you prove yourself on that level, like, I mean, he's irrelevant to me as an athlete. You know what I mean? I would love to fight him just because of how many people are on that hype train. Uh, that hype stopping hype trains is how I built my career. I call him the sugar boy. Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. No, I, I was just looking at the clock. Okay. Okay. Well then let me wrap up this with you. Um, because we were at that DC fight and I know a huge topic of conversation in the MMA world the past couple of months is judging I know we were also at that Houston card. There's some controversy there. Yeah. Um, how would you fix the judging in MMA? Uh, well, I th- 
the problem we had with with okay, so let's take two of the judges at the Washington D.C. fight. Uh, literally had never actually registered any professional experience fighting or judging MMA. So you're going well. Washington D.C. isn't exactly known for his MMA scene. So you have two guys that are pr- primarily just boxing judges that have maybe watched MMA but don't actually understand any of the techniques. These guys are watching a fight with blindfolders. They have absolutely no fucking idea what's going on. Uh, so, I mean, I think the UFC is almost have, they almost need to step in and, and have, you know, uh, a, to match whatever local athletic commission. Um, and I've thought about this a lot. I really, really thought about it, especially after that fight. I thought about it a lot. I'm like, how could, I mean, literally, like, I'm not going to sit here and complain about what happened. How, what could we actually do to change it? And I think the UFC needs to have like a handful of their own appointed judges to kind of go against. So instead of having three judges, this isn't boxing. Why not have seven? You know what I mean? And why not have, uh, you know, four of them be, uh, you know, ex-MMA fighters or guys that the UFC, you know, trusts and knows uh, from different athletic commissions. And why not have those people come in? I mean, you're talking about, like, some of these these judges, like, you're, you're talking about someone that has no experience uh, judging an MMA fight, judging the biggest MMA fights in the world. Like, you're talking, I mean, that's insane to me. I mean... Even at the at the highest level, if, let's say that you have a title fight in in Washington D.C. Or, or Texas or somewhere, you're talking like you we're talking about millions of dollars. We're talking about people's lives, like long term. Like they can really mess stuff up, uh, and it's amazing to me that 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 no one is is doing anything to change it. But that's because you know the local the local athletic commissions are a pain in the ass to deal with, and there's nothing. There's no like hard rule set across the board. Yeah, it's just crazy to me that it's very state by state. Mm-hmm. There's no like governing body or that all these different athletic commissions can go to and turn to as kind of the precedent or the set and standards. They all have to set their own. If I was a fighter, that would just drive me nuts because you know yeah. it's going to vary state by state. Right. And you already have your hands full getting prepared for your opponent. Then to think about the judging and not knowing if it's going to be scored the same way as it was in your last fight in a different region of the world, it's... That's frustrating as hell. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And what can we do as athletes? You know what I mean? We pretty much just bitch and complain and hope something changes. Just keep making noise on the Schmo's own podcast That's about exactly it. right. That's why we're doing it. Uh, I'd be a liar if I said that's it. We'd still need to get a couple of quick last predictions from you. Uh, we use mybookie.ag. Go to mybookie.ag. Use the promo code SchmoZone. They'll match up to... off of what you put into it. So that means if you put $250, they'll give you an extra $125. You put in $500, they'll give you an extra $250. Go there, use the promo code SchmoZone, mybookie.ag. We got to see this fight happen. I know it's the fifth time they're putting it on. Tony Ferguson, Habib, who would you take? Uh, I'm going to take Habib. Just based on everything leading up to the fight, I think that... uh, I think Ferguson's going to do exactly what everyone thinks Ferguson's going to do. He's going to try to fight Khabib off his back. And that's the absolute worst thing in the world for him. It's not going to end well. He's not going to submit Khabib. Uh, I think that the only chance Tony Ferguson has a win in this fight is to go out and wrestle first. You know, be a wrestler. He's a wrestler. I mean, he started as a wrestler. He's a Michigan guy. He, You know, just like me. I mean, I wrestled on the same team Michigan as him. Like, he should go out and try to wrestle him. And that's the, the only chance he has... If he could take him down one time, it could change everything in that fight. I mean, takedowns, they mean a lot. Uh, and that's the only way I see that he wins. But I just don't think that he's in the mental place to do anything smart right now. If we see this fight card, you know, God willing, all the situation, Dustin Poirier against Dan Hooker in San Diego. Man, Hooker is on an absolute tear. Uh, but I'm a huge Poirier fan. I think that stylistically, I think that, I would lean towards uh, Dustin Poirier being able to beat Dan Hooker. Uh, I think that he's going to push him back, and that's going to kind of nullify uh, Hooker's range. I think Dustin Poirier wins that fight. Last but not least, it's not finalized, but we can imagine the trilogy will happen. Stipe in D.C., probably towards the end of summer if it happens. Who do you like in that trilogy? I like D.C. I like D.C. in that fight. I think D.C. is going to go out with a bang. I think he's going to he's gonna show up, and he's going to win that fight for sure. Uh I think he was winning the last one too, and I think he will make them adjustments and and continue to, you know, be a legend in the sport. 
yeah, Stipe went to the body in those later rounds, and that uh, seemed like the winning formula. DC would adjust from that. Any final thoughts in the Schmo Zone, Mr. Wonderful, Cody Stamen? Man, uh, I would just tell everyone to be safe. Uh, my heart goes out to all my uh, blue-collar uh, brothers out there that are, you know, out of work. Uh, man, tough times, but, you know, tough times don't last. Tough people do. Uh, so, yeah, stay strong and, and keep fighting the adversity. Helen, final message for all the people yeah. out there? Well, Cody just said it best where, you know, tough times don't last, tough people do. Just try to stay positive, um, stay strong. We will all get through this together. And like I mentioned earlier, the fun tip, if you do need to go grocery shopping, try doing it earlier, um, right before it opens, actually get in line. I don't want to butcher this, but I do want to say it. I believe it's Latin, Lucter et Emergo. I struggle, but I survive. Keep your chin up and uh, wish the best. Help your neighbors. And this is episode seven of the Schmo Zone. Thanks for tuning in. We're out.